Um, so uh, a very, very warm welcome back to everybody um, to our um, second part this morning. Uh, for the next hour and a half or so, we're going to hear input from various members of the Scottish Educational Research Association Poverty and Education Network. Uh, and we're going to cover quite a lot of ground here. They're all going to have a short period of time to, to tell you about the kind of work they've been doing, the kind of research they've been doing. Um, we're going to we split it into kind of three sections. And uh, at the end of each section, there will be time for you to ask questions or make comments or, or, or enter into some kind of discussion. And I would encourage you to do so. Um, we have uh, researchers and academics from all over Scotland. We're delighted to welcome people from University of Aberdeen, University of Strathclyde, University of Glasgow, Glasgow Caledonian University, Queen Margaret University. Not sure if I've missed any out there. Hope not. Oh, and the Royal, Conser Royal Conservatoire, excuse me. Um, so we've, we've, we've got people, and, and as I said, they've all, they've all been doing different kinds of research in different areas, but all looking at the way that uh, child poverty impacts on school education. So all of it is very relevant for you going into school over the next year and um, further into your career. Some of these issues we're going to talk about today uh, existed pre-COVID. Some were exacerbated by COVID and now becoming quite clearly areas of serious concern and some will just continue post-COVID as well. So I don't want you to think that our network only uh, appeared because of COVID. In fact, it started 2014, 2015, because a good number of um, academics across universities in education were very, very concerned about the increasing impact of poverty in education. So um, our first um, input's going to come from Stuart Hall and Kevin Loudon, both from uh, the Robert Owen Centre in the University of Glasgow. And I'll share the screen. And hand it over to Stuart. Uh, good morning, colleagues. Uh, yeah, as Stephen says, my name's Stuart Hall. I'm from the Robert Owen Centre at the University of Glasgow. And my colleague uh, uh, this morning is Kevin Loudon, who works alongside me. Um, we're, we've kind of taken a wee step to the side this morning. And while we regularly talk about schools, we thought we would talk about another aspect of our work, which is, is still, I guess, of importance when you're thinking about poverty and engagement um, in Scotland. So we're going to talk about a wee bit of work, uh, briefly, that we've been involved with since 2019 with Glasgow Science Centre. And they were in the process of developing a, a, a policy um, that they called Connect because they recognised that traditionally the Science Centre, one, generally charges people for entry, and that in itself is a barrier, um, that when they looked at the profile of who comes to the centre and what the local populace looks like, there was clearly a mismatch. But they also went a bit further and began to think about um, the profile of the staff, the staff complement in the Science Centre and the extent to which that reflected the local populace. And they were also um, looking at developing an outreach programme. So to widen, I guess, their connections, can they develop or could they develop an outreach programme that would, that would actually allow them to connect with those communities largely around Glasgow City that they've generally failed to engage with over the 21 years or so that the Science Centre has been in existence. So major, major funding input from the Wellcome Trust allowed them to spend a significant amount of money on the building and developing uh, what's become a community hub in the centre. And it's only now recently opened because COVID's had a major impact on, on the, the programme. Um, and it's had a major impact on the evaluation that, that we've been involved with, obviously. Uh, the internal organisational changes um, has gone on to some extent, and Kevin will pick that up in a minute or two. And um, they also recruited a dedicated community learning and development team. So although most of the people in the Science Centre are, you would think of as kind of generally educationalists, their, their backgrounds are very much in kind of traditional science subjects, and they really didn't have a, a kind of community learning uh, and development specialism in the centre. And that was seen as an important development in, in reaching out to um, the communities that they were 
Um, previously missing, I guess. Um, can we move on to the next slide? And I think Kevin will pick it up there. Yeah, just just really to, to say something that this was a huge change for the, the Science Centre and in part driven by that welcome uh, funding. To, to get the funding, they had to demonstrate that they were becoming more relevant to the needs of their community. And that included, you know, uh, local communities working with CLD groups, but also schools and teachers. And the centre has a track record of working in a very sort of traditional way with, you know, promoting STEM input to schools. So that was realigned somewhere. And I think they had to tackle uh, looking at this connect ethos and saying, what does that look like as a conceptual underpinning to be more relevant to communities and to empower? Because we're making large claims about the programme would help empower local communities. And I think by bringing in the CLD complement and enhancing that and recruiting these dedicated community learning development team, there's a sort of cultural shift within the organisation which is taking time about how to translate those lofty aims into real practice. And I think we're starting to see, and COVID had disrupted it, but it was also uh, used in a way as a catalyst for a lot of this community engagement. There were new creative ways to do that, working with groups and schools. So this outreach work has taken time to develop, but it is sort of reaching and re-engaging with community groups. Uh, and I think one of the interesting aspects of the, 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 the pandemic has been that this has been enhanced by improving the, the digital side of things, both reaching out, not just to the local community, but to community more widely. And it's trying to use STEM as a way to promote critical thinking, engagement, building relationships in the community. And it's pretty seismic shift in the ethos and also the organization around it. But largely, you know, the, it's led to a raft of alternative delivery methods, everything from online science festivals, resources for schools and communities to, you know, that engagement about reaching out to people, but also attracting people in and turning the centre itself into a far more attractive and engaging uh, resource and centre. Sorry, forgot I was muted. One of the one of the big issues that we encountered early on, and maybe just you know finish off with this, was that in talking with centre staff, the, the kind of existing staff um, had a, a, an, an approach to education that was very much we've got roadshows. When we put a roadshow out every year, we have fifty thousand people that we can tick off have attended our roadshows. And you're telling me that a CLD team will come in and may, might work with a few hundred people. Now, that doesn't seem to be much in the way of impact. And of course, our question was, so demonstrate the impact of the 50,000 people you see every year. Yeah. And so that there's been very much a kind of cultural clash to some extent, a shifting in values and, and a realignment to, you know, to understand some of the complexities there. And that, I think, for the centre is probably one of the biggest um, challenge they've had to face. And I think on the slide it suggested that there was some turnover in the CLD team in the centre. And I think that in itself, I, I guess, reflected some of the some of the difficulties and challenges. Um, although I think it would be fair to say that they, they have emerged at the other end as a wider, perhaps more understanding um, educational organisation. Um, if you want any more information about it, you can always talk to Kevin and I, drop us an email or whatever. We're more than happy to do that, but um, uh, we'll, we'll pull the curtain down at that point. Thank you. Good, thank you. Uh, I now invite Archie Graham from the University of Aberdeen um, for his input. Okay, thanks, Stephen. Uh, okay. I've got a couple of slides, but we don't need to use them if not. I don't, I don't seem to be able to share oh, them. You've, got, you've definitely got the co host. Archie. Oh, oh yeah, it's just, uh, yeah, it's definitely appeared now. <laughs> uh, here we go. Uh, okay, can you see that? Yep. 
Great, thanks, Arch. Okay, yeah, okay, I'll just put, I'm just going to speak to the second slide it, anyway. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Um, so um, I'm just going to um, tell you a little bit about the work that the team at Aberdeen have been doing that involves uh, Peter Matika, Dean Robson, Lindsay McDougall, and uh, um, Kevin Stelfox uh, joined one of our studies at the, the end, end of the, the Scottish Council of Deans project that um, Morag was telling you about earlier on this morning. So much of our research activity centres on the preparation of new teachers for educational inclusion to support positive educational and wider outcomes for all pupils, including those living in poverty. So in this short presentation, uh, we'll provide an overview of our work to date and highlight the need for eliciting the voices of children and young people to enable the co-creation of inclusive pedagogical approaches that focus on raising the attainment of all children and young people in high poverty school environments. So given the complexity of poverty as a concept, uh, we began our work by investigating student teachers' understanding of poverty within the context of rising rates of child poverty, both nationally and internationally, and that was just before the start of the pandemic. Our findings suggested that the student teachers recognised poverty as a real issue applicable to children and young people in Scotland schools. And additionally, they expressed different views as to what constitutes poverty in the Scottish context, often seeing poverty in multi-dimensional and dynamic terms. They also anticipated uh, the likelihood of working with children and young people affected by poverty in the practicum teaching practice. However, the student teachers were less certain about how they would recognise such individuals in the classrooms. And these findings uh, offer a point of reference for thinking about how initial teacher education can be viewed as a site for interrogating the variable nature of poverty in and for the preparation of teachers. And then building on that investigation into the student teachers' understandings of poverty, we then explored student teachers' social capital relations during practicum in schools, uh, which contained high numbers of pupils living in poverty. And while recognising the complexity of practicum in and for initial teacher education and the additional challenges for schools linked to child poverty, this work draws from social capital theory to explore the kinds of social relations uh, associated with student teachers' practicum experience in high poverty school contexts. And the findings from this study suggest that the design of practicum does not currently support the principles of social capital theory. So, so specifically, practicum does not appear to systematically enable student teachers to develop an understanding of how to make connections and develop the social relationships required to support positive educational outcomes for children and young people in such contexts. And we make the case here for more effective joint practice, whereby student teachers work collaboratively with others to better support the professional learning within practicum settings. To enable this, we highlight the pressing need uh, for further research into the redesign of practicum so that student teachers can gain knowledge and practice of relevant co-working skills to equip them to work collaboratively with professionals, specialist teachers, and importantly, practitioners from other children's agencies. In another study, uh, we've been examining the experiences of student and probationer teachers to surface and highlight what they can do in terms of enacting educational inclusion in high poverty school environments. In this research, we sought to surface what student and probationer teachers can do rather than what they cannot do in relation to educational inclusion within such settings. And the findings from this work provide concrete examples of how student and probationer teachers begin to modify their classroom teaching and learning environments by adopting pedagogical practices aimed at including all learners. Examples of the practice offer insights for initial teacher education in terms of preparing student teachers to enter the probationary year with the teacher induction scheme. So in particular, the probationer teachers demonstrated an ability to mobilise readily available teaching strategies, additional support resources and professional relationships to support an inclusive pedagogy. Of particular note were the intra-professional connections fostered by the probationer teachers and pupil support assistants. And such working with others relates to the third principle of inclusive pedagogy, which highlights the relational nature of an inclusive pedagogical approach in responding to learner differences. This finding underscores the importance of foregrounding relationality as a key asset in and for enacting an inclusive pedagogy. And therefore, it would seem beneficial for initial teacher education to to focus support on student teachers developing the capacities necessary for intra-professional working as a starting point for creating wider interprofessional working to support the inclusion of all learners. And in more 
recent work along with, uh, as I mentioned, Kevin Estelle Fox, we investigated how student and beginner teachers make sense of pupil differences in high poverty environments. And our findings showed that the participants were developing awareness of differences between children and young people in their classroom settings in terms of protected characteristics, socioeconomic backgrounds and cultural diversity, and were generally positive about those differences and respecting them. However, they did not appear to make use of this developing awareness to inform their pedagogical approaches to support educational inclusion. And the findings for this study suggest that perhaps more needs to be done to help student and probationer teachers to make sense of and to operationalise the concept of pupil differences in their classroom settings for educational inclusion. And in the wake of the, wake of the COVID-19 pandemic, subsequent school closures and lockdowns, the effects of poverty in the education of children and young people has been exasperated. Therefore, getting to know children and young people and what they need in the current situation is relevant to teaching and learning and is complex and integral to the enactment of an inclusive pedagogy. It underpins pupil-teacher relationships and supports teachers, including student and probationer teachers, to plan meaningful learning opportunities for all learners. So, in our ongoing research, we are now designing a study to look at the idea of developing joint practice with a focus on children and young people's voices in relation to the co-construction of teaching and learning opportunities in schools located in high poverty environments. And we hope that by supporting probationer teachers to elicit the voices of children and young people, they'll be able to co-create inclusive pedagogical approaches that focus on raising the attainment of children and young people in high poverty school environments. Thank you. Thanks very much, Archie. Uh, and now for the final uh, group from for this particular section, I now ask Alistair and Katie from University of Strathclyde. Thanks. You're allowed to speak, Alistair. Okay, is that good? <laughs> Does that come off my minutes? Yes. <laughs> right, Katie and I are going to talk about uh, educational inequality that we've been looking at over the last number of years, some work in schools and more recently in communities. Um, and what I want to do is draw attention to what I see as four uh, sort of key areas of difficulty and how we look at that. If you'd qualified as a teacher 30 odd years ago, you'd have entered a very unequal landscape in terms of educational inequality. Um, and unfortunately, you're probably going to enter the same landscape today, 30 years later. Later, We'll maybe talk a bit more about it, but we're faced with the same situation. So let's have a look at some of the situations or some of the reasons why that might be the case. Um, one of the things that we need to think about is this talk and, and sort of language, um, particularly at the focus on poverty, which I would describe as quite dangerous. Um, research tells us a lot about educational inequality, um, and that's about inequality in a system for everyone that just doesn't privilege the, the elite, but it's for across the social classes, if you like. What we know from that research is that social class is important, ideas around social cultural capital, um, bias of institutions, etc. So it's a very complex landscape that creates inequality. Um, if we focus on poverty, I would argue we divert attention away from that. But some of the key issues and problems um, in the system that create inequality become ignored. It also has the effect, I would argue, of you know, where does it leave people that don't live in poverty? If you come from a working class background, you've got good family income, why is it you don't go to university? Uh, and then we're left with explanations, you're not clever enough, you're not intelligent enough, or you didn't work hard enough. So let's think about framing things around poverty because that causes difficulties. Um, from the research point of view, I think we have a landscape that's totally dominated by let's do a pilot project, see if something works, and then bring in an, inter an intervention, roll it out across the country, et cetera. Again, a dangerous policy, very, very difficult to measure impact, to organize and find these magic solutions. It's like we're searching for some incredible kind of formula or equation that can solve inequality. That very positivist mechanism um, doesn't recognize what happens in different communities, doesn't recognize what happens in cities or urban areas, et cetera. And, and let's face it, if any of that sort of mentality of finding a solution, piloting it, piloting it, 
um, you know, measure and impact and expanding. If any of that worked, um, we'd already have discovered that and the, the magic solution would have changed things. So that focus is very unhelpful. It's exemplified by the Education Endowment Foundation kind of toolkit approach. So that's another category I would say sort of ranks as almost dangerous. Um, what about giving money to schools then? PEF and SAC funding that we've heard about this morning. Again, a tricky one. Um, a lot of the work that we have seen has seen people start to encourage, schools start to encourage parental engagement, try to move towards more community-based work because they're recognizing the difficulties and what children face within their local communities. Research side of things, that's a school-centric sort of approach, largely seen to be ineffective, largely seen to absorb a lot of money for very little return. Um, what we're seeing in some of the, the work we're doing is that what schools are doing is reinventing community work that's actually had funding withdrawn from it. So family with support workers, local community um, activists that were doing things in the community have had their funding withdrawn. Now we've got schools with funding and they're employing family workers and so on. So very tricky policy, I think, in terms of giving money to schools and ignores the wider sort of social issues that exist um, within communities. Role of institutions, schools, uh, universities, probably in particular, I would argue that they're delivering quite misguided, ill-informed policy, if you like, policy that's not grounded in research, doesn't understand the, the different dimensions to inequality. Because they carry on, because we go, and I say we because we're part of the university network, because we continue with that, we're actually quite complicit in creating inequality. If you couldn't qualify or become a doctor from a working class background 30 years ago, it's probably three times as hard now. And why is that? And universities play a big role. So the sort of bias, explicit bias and implicit bias we see within universities and schools is really important, whether it's admission criteria to university or what we actually teach teachers in terms of understanding the different dimensions of inequality. So role of institutions, I would say, is something that is really difficult. And you could argue it's done, they've all done a very good job of maintaining educational inequality as we see it today. So any ways forward for this, I think we need a, a really good discussion of why inequality occurs. Um, and we need a commitment to change in society that's gonna make a lot of us very uncomfortable. It's gonna shake up the way we do things. It's gonna challenge institutions in particular. I think we need research to inform it. Um, research that's funded into how we do things in Scotland, for example, it's probably the equivalent of you know, the running costs of a small nursery school. I mean, it's largely, you could say it's pathetic. There's nothing there. Um, and if we'd address the pandemic with the same level of research, we'd probably all be dead. So let's just think about how much we invest in that. Um, we need a commitment to challenge and expose the sort of mechanisms that are out there that challenge, that create inequality. And we largely ignore that. Um, and that's what I think our focus needs to be um, from there on. And I've said they're sort of sarcastically easy, but I don't want it to, to, you know, I think we can put effort into it that can make change but it's got to be a lot more substantive and grounded in, in sort of ideas about inequality and research than what it is at the moment. Brilliant, thank you. If you stop sharing, Alistair, that'd be great. Brilliant, okay, we, we've just got a couple of minutes. <laughs> uh, if anybody wants to raise their hand and maybe ask a question or make a comment, um, a really nice challenging piece from Alistair and Kate at the end there. Um, let me ask a question, Alistair, then. So, so how, how are you going to address the universities? How, how, how are they going to change and stop being complicit in, in sustaining inequality? Well, I mean, I think, I think one of the first stages is to actually understand the mechanisms we have in place. So, you know, there's a good example, teacher training. A lot of teacher trainer colleges uh, or universities won't let you in without experience. How possible is it to get that kind of experience as a classroom assistant or something like that if you're uh, coming from a working class or a very poor background? Probably impossible. So, you know, things like that. Um, if you look at admissions to, to medicine, 80 odd percent of people come from very middle class backgrounds and so on. So we need an investigation of why that's the case. The case. Universities use the UK CAT test for admissions to medicine, dentistry, law, et cetera completely discriminatory against those from a work, working class or a poor background. So there's quite conspicuous things we can look at, but we need to kind of have the heart to, to take those ideas forward and explore it. 
Okay, good. Now, the, 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 the second question I've got for you is that you, you have consistently uh, introduced class into your discussion over, gosh, the last 10 years even. Um, why, why do you do that? Because very few other people in this kind of conversation use the term class. Uh, I, I don't know why people don't talk about class. Maybe it's a bit annoying or uncomfortable or we just try to ignore it. Um, but I think I introduced it because a lot of the work we do is in schools, catchments where poverty isn't the issue. The poorest kids in the school um, obviously will suffer with attainment. But what we're also looking at is great swathes of, of young people from quite solid working class backgrounds, you probably described, who won't succeed in education, won't come out of that education system um, with qualifications and won't go into higher education and certainly won't enter the professions. So if you have a community of people, you know, from parts of Glasgow, for example, where it's predominantly working class with some areas of really acute poverty and mm -hmm. nobody becomes a doctor, lawyer, teacher, social worker, that's an unequal system that, that we need to challenge. And the explanations for that, I would argue, come from looking at ideas of social class. OK, that's really helpful. Has anybody got a final question before we move on? Alistair, yeah. really good stuff as usual and challenging. And I'm thinking, you know, given the, the range of those, those powerful challenges, what role is there for the teacher? What can a teacher do in a school? What can schools do faced with that, that type of challenge? Uh, I think that's an interesting one, but I mean, I was in a school recently where the head teacher had decided his staff as a whole didn't understand inequality and poverty in the lives that the, the kids were working in, didn't understand what a working class background meant. And he actually introduced a, a sort of series of events in the school over a number of weeks so that he could guarantee his teachers would be much more sensitive and understanding of what the situations were and not make assumptions about the kids. So that's just one small example. So, I mean, in some ways, it, if you start to talk about social class and unequal societies, it becomes like unsolvable, you know, how do we dismantle capitalism? But there's a lot of things within the system that actually have quite simple solutions and quite simple ways to, to make a step forward. Now I'm going, to ask, I'm going to ask Francis Wilde to come in. Francis, if you don't mind, if you want to read out your question. Um, yeah, hiya. Uh, sorry, I'm not feeling very well, so I thought I'd type it instead. Of we can hear you. Okay, great. Um, I was just wondering whether it's felt that poverty is half of the equation. I know that can seem a bit existentialist, but uh, is it felt that there is room for conversations of wealth and excess and its effects within educational inequality? Sorry, what was the last sentence, Francis? I missed that. Uh, is there room for conversations of wealth and excess and its effects within educational in inequality? <coughs> yeah, I mean, from, from my point of view, um, a lot of the work we've done has actually looked at what happens in, in private schools, public schools, um, and what, you know, the, the sort of top end of the spectrum and how it functions, um, because I think you can learn an awful lot from that. So I'd need time to kind of formulate a good answer for you. But in the immediate, I would say we learn a lot about how we reproduce inequality by looking at the elite. Uh, and one of the things we've recognized in the elite schools um, and private schools and so on is the effort they put into it. Uh, they put a lot of effort into those young people and they create young people that will move seamlessly into higher positions in society. Uh, we don't do that in state schools. A lot of, well, most state schools, if not all. So I think we can learn a lot from that side of the equation. Right. Stuart Kevin, do you want a quick word on that question before we move on? Hey, I, I was only going to say, actually, I, I, I thought Alistair's response there was absolutely in line with what I would be thinking myself. So, yeah. Okay, okay. Yeah. Okay. Good. Right. So that's brilliant. And thanks. It's, it, thanks, Francis, for that. Really, a question we might actually come back to near the end of our discussion. So we move on, folks. Um, I'm delighted to welcome Aunt, Aunt Dr. Angela Jap and Dr. Leo Moscardini from the Royal Conservatoire. Thanks for the drum introduction as well. It's very much appreciated to whoever did that. Um, so our conversation this morning is looking at poverty in education and it's a, it will be a double act between Leo and myself. What we'll be really thinking about this morning 
and about the challenges for music education. It's very hard to fit it into an eight minute slot, but we're going to try our best to give you a very much an overview of the situation, an overview of the context. First of all, we're going to look at access to music education. And then what we'll do is I'll hand over to Leo, who will drill down a wee bit more in relation to digital access and digital engagement with music, particularly since COVID times. And that the whole concept of access to music education is a very broad one. It's a very diverse one in a lot of ways as well. But just to, to kind of pin our colours to the mast, what I'll speak about this morning is about school-based access to music. But there's a lot of ways about um, accessing. It's around about ability, ability to pay, ability of actual standard, um, disability, um, finance and genre. Genre has a large role in this, but what we'll be thinking about is music is part of mandatory school education and is part of the expressive arts in school. So music is available in schools through a variety of ways, through classroom-based learning, through instrumental learning, and also through extracurricular activities. Most schools and school communities will have a very strong culture of music, a strong community of music through their shows or concerts or showcases, participating in local and national competitions. But it's actually thinking about how do we get pupils to that stage? How do we get pupils from accessing that core opportunity that's part of that mandatory education process and to allow them to participate and contribute to these wider communities of music. Music is still actually perceived as being for few rather than for the many. And the thing that really holds music back in some ways are the costs. And that was present pre-COVID as well, very much a, a, a key element of it. Um, it was put out of the reach of many children and families. The one that really drove the, the financial demand was about instrumental instruction. So you get your classroom music, but if you wanted to learn oboe or keyboard or guitar or something that was a wee bit different and wanted it in a one-to-one -one basis, then it was very likely as a, a pupil at school that you would be expected to pay for that tuition. That wasn't even including the rental of the instruments, it was only about the tuition. Now that varied across all the local authorities. From all the 32 local authorities, you went from zero payment all the way through to over £535. I think one, uh, one local authority did charge about £800 at one stage, but the big drive over the past few years is how do we make this free? How do we make this an opportunity for all pupils to engage in with no cost? Yes, rental of instruments may be an issue still, but how do we actually get pupils to have that opportunity to access instrumental instruction? What we find, and it's unsurprising really, is that children from young, from deprived backgrounds were less, were more likely to be excluded from opportunities to engage in music because of the financial contributions and therefore less likely to take advantage of opportunity in the wider music industry. So it's kind of how do we take down those barriers? First of all, how do we acknowledge the barriers which are in existence and how do we help pupils and support pupils to overcome them, to enable them to access the very rich opportunities that are out there for them? To help contextualise it a wee bit more, I'm going to show you in the next slide a few key landmarks that have come about over the past few years. The most, the most current one, the most interesting one in terms of that snapshot of what's happened in Scottish music education is from what's going on now. And that was an update in a 2003 project called What's Going On. And that was all about what's happening in terms of young people's music making across Scotland. It gave an idea about the types of communities, the community learning, the education that young people were accessing in relation to music education. The one in the middle, Change the Tune, Invest in Instrumental Music, is one that has been growing since about 2006. And the driver behind that was the EIS, in addition to all the other unions, looking for ways to help reduce the cost, if not negate them completely, in relation to music tuition. So that one-to-one -one instrumental tuition. And last year, we did actually put it into play that we could have free instrumental tuition. So it took, what, 15 years to actually get that into play. The one in the top right is a music manifesto for Scotland, and that was a result of the political parties coming together and realising the importance of musical and music education for children in Scotland and all of the pressure groups. So you had a lot of people, for example, Creative Scotland, MEPIG, ourselves at the Conservatoire, all contributed to the manifesto. And that manifesto really champions the fact that music education should be a right of all children in Scotland and looking at ways that we can make access to that much easier. It also refers to the need for teachers to be upskilled, and I'll touch upon that in a couple of seconds time.
The one that Leo and myself and Alistair and, and uh, Andy Ray got involved in last year was about music education in primary school in Scotland. So what I've mentioned so far is about kind of the global picture in Scotland and about the instrumental instruction, but actually the first port of call, the first real example of formal music education for children and young people would be in the primary school. But sadly, what we found out from our responses was only 3% of children in Scotland were regularly accessing that as part of the mandatory schooling. So there are all these opportunities that we have at our hands in Scotland, but there's a disconnect about how we actually engage with them and how we participate with them. So what did that look like when it came into COVID times? Leo, I'll hand over to you, I'll do your slides. How long have I, how long have I got, Angela? Um, Stephen, about four minutes. <laughs> Right, okay. I'll try and do it quickly. That um, that primary music project, one of the other things that came out, incidentally, I share all of Alistair's views around class, um, but I'll try not get to uh, go off at a tangent on that. But um, that primary music project, one of the things we found was that uh, there was a significant number of children for whom music was um, described as practically non-existent. Um, and it was quite a surprising um, number of primary schools. I think Angela was at about 75% or something like that in yeah. schools. And it was three times more likely to be the case in areas of high deprivation. So um, kids in more deprived areas were very likely um, not, not to have music. Um, this We Make Music Online was a, a project that I, I did with Andy Ray. Um, it, was, it was a kind of commission from um, MEPEG on, uh, it, it was immediately, on, on lockdown about how instrumental teachers and music teachers uh, moved online. And very quickly, well, what we saw was particularly in relation to the um, digital divide was a widening of the gap um, of, of children who actually had access. Those, those children who were already engaged in music had a better chance of, of being involved in it. Um, those music organisations who moved most quickly were the ones who were outside local authorities. They weren't bound up with the bureaucracies of local authorities. Organisations, community-based ones, organisations like Tinderbox, who do um, amazing work, moved online literally within days, within about two or three days of lockdown, whereas schools, um, you're talking about weeks before they, 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 they were actually able to get things going. Um, Interestingly, one of the things that came out very strongly was that the, the, many of the tutors who were working online felt that they had better relationships with the families because they were having to kind of negotiate, set things up on, online. And so they're getting to know families. That was a bit of a surprising find. Um, and one of the other things that came out was that the, the, the teachers, the instrumental teachers who were working online were working with kids who they were already um, engaged with. So they didn't have to contend with how would they get new starts. And they, they actually, many of them expressed a concern about, you know, in fact, that many of them actually said, well, wouldn't like to start off um, kids online, which relates to that first point about the widening of the gap, because if you can't have access to the internet and you don't have, that, that, you know, those, those, those facilities, then you might not get online in the first place. Um, this relates to what Alistair was talking about, that the children who were geographically excluded, kids in more rural areas were, were, were um, most likely to benefit from being online. And I, I particularly dislike the term gifted and talented. It's quite an English term. Um, I don't believe that, uh, you know, you have people who are gifted and talented in music. What we find is this idea that you're um, musically um, talented is, is more or come from musical families it's probably more the case that they actually come from middle class families than come from um, musical families and it was those children who were most likely to benefit from um, being online with those kids who had the kind of cultural capital where there was things on going in the house that would allow them to participate um, the data also showed that the children least likely to participate were care experienced young people and uh, you know people who had sensory impairments and, and, and people who you know came from kind of quite adverse kind of circumstances um, and the other thing that was surprising about the um, move to online was that in spite of all the, 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 the very slow, almost non-existent support of education in Scotland that teachers developed, teachers made it work. I described it in the report as what Lipsky talks about as um, street level bureaucrats, that the teachers actually made it work um, in, in, in spite of all the restrictions around them. Um, I'll go to the next slide, Angela. Just, Quickly. So in terms of making it um, accessible for all, and this uh, comes through per particularly from the primary education report, where one of the things that came over very strongly was a lack of confidence um, and, and opportunities for teachers learning. And, and the, one of the recommendations for that was to structure support with what's available within their communities and, and you know, what, what's at hand to support teachers so that they're um, able to uh, 
implement music in, in the classrooms. Uh, you know, at the moment things stand, the, the, one of the, the, the kind of key findings from that primary report was basically the, there was a really strong 98% felt that music should be in every classroom. But I think 70, was it 75 or 78%, I think said that, um, you know, it should be somebody else, as long as it's not me that's teaching the music, you know, there should be some kind of specialist coming in. Uh, doing it. So there's a real issue around what goes on in initial teacher education, the, pre the preparation of teachers and how they come to be supported once they're actually, um, you know, in, in, in practice. As far as instrumental is, in, instruction is concerned, there still continues to be a, 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 this very sort of strong kind of classical Western um, tradition that, that, that drives it. There's a sort of elitism. Um, I did a study, oh gosh, about 10 years ago, in which I have a, a group of over 5,000 potential children. There was not a single child with a, 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 any sort of physical impairment or any significant learning difficulties in getting lessons. So it's very much built along historically around, around processes of selection, which isn't in every local authority, but it still, still continues. Um, while it is now free, and that Scottish government simply reinstating what used to be there in the first place, um, there's still uh, um, an issue around the reduction of uh, teaching staff. The, the, the sort of recent figures that Scottish government have put out show that since 2013, there was 651 full-time instructors, and in 2020-2021, which are the most recent figures that we have, there are 617, so it's not a significant drop. But if you go back to 2008, there were actually over 1,200 instructors. So since 2008, the, 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 the teaching force has actually halved, and yet the demand has increased significantly. So, um, and there's also an issue of, around the deployment of instructors in terms of how they're, they're fed down through the system. It relates to what Alistair was saying, because in many authorities, they're deployed. Lee, I'm going to have to ask you oh. to wind up if you don't mind. All right, okay, right, okay. Um, I'll just, uh, yeah, it's just the social, cultural, economic barriers to participation was, was really significant. And that shows in, in, in all the studies, it shows in the case studies that Alistair and I carried out for the What's Going On Now report. Um, and it shows basically in all of the, the work that Angela was flagging up, and I'll, I'll leave it there then. Okay, thank Good. you. Thanks, thanks, thanks Leo and Angela. I'll now ask um, Dr. Cat Lord and Dr. Simon Holt from Queen Margaret University to deliver their presentation on the same kind of topic of music, which is an interesting one because it's, it's not one we normally think about. Uh, hi, everybody. So I am Dr. Lord Watson and uh, Dr. Simon Holt works with me at Queen Margaret University. I'm a senior lecturer and he is our associate head of division in the ITE program at QMU, which you will all know is still a fairly new program. Um, so thank you very much to everyone who's spoken already. It's been really um, interesting to hear from the other, um, the other people on the call. Uh, we are looking to develop and are in the process of studying an initial pilot of a program that we're calling Singing for Health, um, which is about creating sustainable music education for Scottish schools. And I'm just going to take you through a little bit of the rationale for why we decided to do this. Um, taking the points that Alistair had raised about interventions uh, coming from a place that often is informed by a middle class elitist perspective that often are what we would call back home in Canada extractive um, uh, projects where we go into communities that we consider to be uh, in need of our support and our help and we are going to bring a programming intervention that will uh, provide this support and help gather data leave with the data and ultimately who benefits is the researchers and the institutions. Um, we were very aware of that um, problem within uh, research and we do not seek to replicate that. Although for sake of clarity, we call this an intervention so it makes sense when we're speaking about it because we're working not only within our own context as researchers, but we're also working with a community-based partner called Love Music, which some of you may or may not be aware of, who provide music education for some of the most vulnerable um, populations in our society. It was very important to us when we decided to partner with them that we would be creating a long-term sustainable approach to providing music education. And I'm going to explain to you how we're trying to subvert the normal process of school-based interventions in a way that 
actually does provide this sustainable solution, especially in relation to what Angela and Leo have just been speaking to us about, about the issue with finding a way to provide music education en masse to the people who have the, uh, who traditionally are excluded from that access to education. So we are particularly interested in looking at how taking part in a Singing for Health initiative or program can impact positively on children's self-reported and objective um, report um, data indicating their stress levels. And we want to look specifically at children who are most vulnerable, whether that is children with um, dealing with adverse childhood experiences or children living in poverty. We know that there's correlations between those. Um, so we are also really interested in making sure that this program was being put in the places where, as Angela and Leo have identified, are most likely not to receive sustained music education. Um, I'm not going to go into the policy and the research because we don't have so much time and I, it, we've had a lot of discussion about that already. So what I'm going to do is actually speak to you about where we are and where we're trying to go, because especially with the expertise we have on the call, uh, both Simon and myself would love to have feedback um, from people because, like I have said at the beginning, we really want to do something different with this and are trying to conceptualize this and work in a way that is truly um, working on behalf of the people that we're looking to um, support with this program. So right now we're in phase one, uh, coming to the end of it. Uh, we've had a pilot program running in two separate schools here in the city of Edinburgh. They're both in SIMD decils one and two. Uh, we are doing a qualitative case study approach to this. Uh, we're doing focus groups with the children and we have interviews with the teachers and the parents just to get a subjective self-reported evidence from them on whether or not this has any value. Uh, we've been really lucky uh, with uh, Again, going back to moral and ethical issues and how we conduct our research, we have an opt-in approach to research. We think it's really important that if we're studying children, um, that their parents are opting them into it. I know that there's cases where people choose to use an opt-out approach. So we're definitely trying to, again, combat that sort of extractive research technique by having children opt in and their parents opting in. Um, but what we have done is go to the head teachers of the schools that we're working with and ask them to identify children in their school that are in most need of support in most need or would benefit most from taking part in this. So we have children who are some of the most vulnerable children in areas of already really high deprivation, which make um, us provide that assumption that they're already vulnerable in the first place. So we have those children in our programs, and this is where we are. We're coming to the end of this. We're gonna have a little concert. Children will be able to perform them for their school, and we'll be um, thematically analyze, analyzing the data after that. This moves us into phase two. Phase two is an expansion of the pilot. We already have, um, a commitment from the City of Edinburgh Council in terms of wanting to expand the pilot and looking to do that uh, next in the next school term. And while we expand the pilot, we're going to introduce two new elements. One is a student teacher training program for our students, teachers here in the IT program at QMU. And the other is a biometric study. So we want to be able to follow up on what we find from the qualitative case study with biometrics. Um, we are going to be looking to have the children wear wearable technology to just monitor their stress levels and stress scores. Um, and can, I won't go into the details of that because we have a, a, a detailed protocol for that, but we're, we're, we're looking to provide some of that quantitative evidence for whether or not there's any impact of taking part in the program. Um, and then we're gonna be moving into phase three where we're gonna refine the pupil program based on the qualitative and the quantitative data and the teacher training program, which we will um, look to expand in future cohorts of our student teachers um, and are looking for anyone on the call for people who would might be interested in having us expand that into their ITE training as well and expand the Singing for Health program um, beyond the city of Edinburgh to other local authority areas. And ultimately where we want to end up is which, with a teacher training program that's accessible through CPD um, that's done in a meaningful and impactful way for teachers um, that they see as useful 
and would like to use and have the skills and abilities to use through going through the training as opposed to sitting in a CPD session as a former primary school teacher um, and being spoken to and leaving with very little um, tangible practical skills that I can take back to the classroom. Um, and we also are looking to develop a school certification award program similar to the Digital Schools Award or the Eco Schools Awards so that we're building up a, a body of teaching professionals who would see the value in this provided we are able to demonstrate that value through the research and also a, a certification program that can encourage schools to adopt the values of the program and really embed the benefits of music education in their school day and their classrooms and i'll hand it off to simon to pick up all the things that i've probably forgotten <laughs> no i think i think you've you've whizzed through that really really beautifully Kat, from, from my view um, anyway i was just going to pick up on the the teacher education side of things maybe a wee bit more and um, and also the relationships that we that, that exist and building on those relationships with love music and their continued relationship with the existing schools in edinburgh uh, makes that very much more uh, we have we think an impactful um piece of, of, of research and, and intervention if we want to use that term but also very strongly um potentially um sustainable um so love music are going to work with our year two student teachers um, and that year has a particular focus on expressive um, arts, um, which also links back to Angela and Leo's um, research around thinking about the development of, of the confidence to teach music um, by our student teachers. And that's something that we, we very much hope to look at, look at the process by which Love Music engage with our students and, 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 um, and, and capture that in various digital forms to, to support student teachers going forward in terms of building that confidence. And obviously, then, if we're thinking of a, of a program such as Queen Margaret with 130 student teachers in each academic year, we can build confident uh, music teachers as part of our um, repertoire of students becoming um, probationers and beyond. There's a very strong development of, uh, of capacity um, in that process. And, and as Kat says, if we can partner with other institutions as well, we're very happy to, to build and grow that. As, as we go through. So it's very much early stages. Um, we think we've got a strong uh, basis. The research is, is ongoing um, and uh, we'd love to come back and report more as we get through various uh, stages and, and the process. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Kat. Thank you, Simon. Um, so two very, very interesting presentations. Uh, again, I'd invite any, just put your hand up or put something in chat, any questions or clarifications you would like from either set of presenters. Um, all right, then, well, in that case, I'm, I'm going to throw that, that Fran Francis Wilde's question to our two sets of presenters, which I think is a really good question. So I'm going to repeat it. I'm just wondering whether it is felt that poverty is half of the equation. Is there room for conversations of wealth and excess and its effects within educational inequality? So either set would like to even even have a few thoughts on it, but I don't think you can answer it today. Well, um, I'm quite happy to tackle that right off the get go because I uh, felt very similarly and have the same sort of passion that Alistair um, brought to the discussion. I am a working class academic. I come from a working class background. I grew up in what would be considered extreme poverty here in the developed world, which is a term that I don't even like using. Um, and I statistically shouldn't be on a call with a PhD speaking to all of you. Um, and I find that having worked in the state sector, as well as the private sector as a primary school teacher, there are huge issues in how wealth impacts on education. I think Angela and Leo were already speaking about that um, in a way that was really compelling. Uh, it's also impacts as like Alistair was saying on the type of research that gets done because of the assumptions that underlie the research, assumptions that people aren't even aware that they have, which isn't to vilify them at all. How can you be aware of it if you have no other context in which you work um, and have grown up? So for me, when I'm thinking about what I'm trying to do here uh, with this program is trying to create a space for children to have the capacity to have the same opportunities as children who have 
far more from the get-go. Um, and this is a huge problem in Scottish education. I came here and I was uh, shocked, especially um, is now living in the city of Edinburgh, to see what is essentially a two-tier system. And it's meant to create a two-tier society, as far as I can tell. It's designed deliberately to do that. Um, and it is meant to separate people from the humanity that connects all of us across our social classes. Um, and part of what I'm trying to do with this um, and which Simon and I are trying to do with this is to combat that idea that you can't be a musician if you're not a trained musician, um, that you can't lead music in a school because you're not a music specialist um, and that everyone has the capacity to take part in that. So I think that question is a really important question. I think it's a particularly important question for working in a place like Scotland and Britain, where, um, and, and in certain areas of Scotland and certain areas of, Brit uh, of, of England, where we do have this two-tier system, which is limiting for everyone, I would argue. And I'll end by saying it's just as damaging in certain ways, not always, obviously not in material ways, but possibly in cognitive and intellectual ways and development ways to the people who uh, go through school, like Alistair saying, have everything provided for them to be able to do very well in their tests. And then the first time they experience real problem and strife in life, they're adults in a profession and they don't know how to interact with that. So I always maintain that if I want a doctor operating on me, I want a doctor who has failed multiple times and has been so motivated to be a doctor that they've kept going and got their certifications and got their qualifications and now are the doctor operating on me, as opposed to somebody who's never failed at all and the first time they're failing is when they're actually on the job and don't know how to deal or cope with that and haven't developed that resilience. So I have lots of thoughts on this and I'm gonna shut up now, but thanks, I do have thanks, lots thanks, of thoughts. Yeah. Um, Angela or Leo, you've, you've I'll, got I'll, minutes. I've got one, one comment to say and then yeah. Leo might chip in. Actually, it's about Kat's point about musicianship. That's a big thing we're trying to really understand in music is about that musical identity. Who is a musician? Who can be a musician? Because it's trying to get through the constructs in here to challenge about everyone has the capacity to be musical. Everybody has the same right of access, but it's really trying to challenge who, who should be a who can be a musician? How do we access that? I just wanted to pick up on that about musical identity. Leo, do you want to chip in and Francis? Yeah, well, just I'll, I'll I'll just answer it with an anecdote, but very quickly. I mean, I think you could answer Francis's question in one one word, and it's yes. Yes, there is room for conversations about that. Um, when, when I was doing here's the anecdote. When I was doing, I was doing with Alistair and and, and David. Baron started looking at who gets to play, who were the kids that, that get to play musical instruments in, in primary schools. And, and we looked across, uh, we did a survey, um, I won't name, well, well, I will, they, one of them was uh, included Glasgow schools. And a friend at the time who uh, was Debbie head teacher in a large primary school in a big um, estate in the, um, or scheme, however you want to call it, in the south side of Glasgow, asked me why couldn't he get any instrumental instructors to come into his school? And I said, I don't know, but I'll maybe be able to let you know it once I've um, carried out this study. And what I found out at that time, and, and Glasgow wasn't the only local authority was doing it, I don't think they do it anymore, but some still do, was that the um, musical instrument instrumental instructors were deployed into primary schools. The first place that they were deployed was in, in uh, the secondary for those schools where they had a lot of kids doing higher music and then they were filtered down through the school and into the feeder primaries for those schools where they had a lot of kids doing higher music and so in those areas where you had secondary schools where you didn't have many kids doing higher music or you didn't have any kids doing higher music they weren't going to get instrumental music instructors so it really was the Matthew effect you know the rich getting richer and the poor getting poorer and I asked my friend you know what are the likelihood of your kids going to secondary school and doing higher music and he just kind of laughed and he said you couldn't and I said well that's why you're not getting them into the primary so it was real um, inequality of opportunity it really hits what um, all those points that Alistair was making about you know just a whole really unequal system that's really structural so yeah thanks Leo thanks, yeah, Stephen. thanks. Stephen if you don't mind me just chipping in finally just thinking there's a wider discussion there for initial teacher education um, for sure and it's yeah. something that those questions definitely need to be discussed it's just something that Queen Margaret maybe as a new provider of initial teacher education in a division of psychology sociology and education we bring those different lenses to look at poverty and look at the notions of capital 
and all those sorts of dimensions which then have an impact on the classroom and the dynamics and all the different ensuing um, outcomes that, that we know are very, very strong in the reproductive nature of society, which we all want to challenge, but we know is, uh, is, yeah. is, is that, really hard. Yeah, and I think that's a really good point, and it's certainly something we need to think about as, as a network and as a community going forward. Thank you very much, everybody. Um, now, unfortunately, it's me, quickly, uh, followed by John, and hopefully Alison Mitchell will be joining us. Um, so, okay, sorry, I'm going to have to start sharing. Okay. So I, I, I want to talk about this topic again. I've spoken about it before, but I, I, I just think it's such an important topic, uh, young carers. Um, during the pandemic, the work and responsibilities of young carers and the particular challenges they faced during restrictions and lockdowns um, were explored and research became and I think the point is that it became better known and understood in the public forum. Um, young carers in some ways were kind of kind of hidden away from, from public guys and even from some research. Now, young carer, according to the statutory guidance to the Carers Scotland Act 2016, uh, is any young person who is under 18 and has caring responsibilities for a family member or members or friend. It also refers to a young person who's 18 and has remained at school and still has caring responsibilities. Now, the, 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 the really crucial point here, though, is there is no lower age limit. And the Scottish government actually acknowledges there may be a small number of young carers who are very young, possibly even preschool stages or early years of primary schooling. In other words, the, a young carer could be someone as young as five or maybe even younger. The person or persons cared for are likely to be ill, have a disability, a mental health condition, or possibly suffer from drug or alcohol addiction or some related health problems. And the caring can include this list I've got here, can include medical or nursing care, uh, including taking medication, applying dressings, could be personal care, such as helping somebody to wash, dress, eat, could be practical support, helping someone to attend medical appointments, could be cleaning the house, accompanying social events, and of course it can be emotional support. A young carer often has a role in caring for younger siblings. And in 2019, the Scottish Government started to award an annual Young Carers Grant for young people aged 16 to 18 who spend an average of 16 hours a week caring for somebody in receipt of disability benefit. This grant of £305 10p can be used for any purpose. And of course, what, what, one of the issues here, and it's normally here where I I include a slide about, well, how many young carers do, does the government think there are and how many young carers do we think there are? And I'm not going to bother because actually nobody knows. One of the major issues is that many young people are caring and don't see themselves as young carers. And of course, the support is not available to them unless they are registered as young carers. And that takes us to the nub of the problem. Why is this such a big issue? Young carers are not necessarily in situations of poverty and deprivation but the evident, evidence indicates that many of them are in homes with very limited resource. And this latest um, table I've nicked off the government shows us that uh, across the SIND scale, young carers are more likely to be in a more deprived area than one of the least deprived areas. Uh, the two extreme ends, 14% of young carers in the carer census lived in the most deprived Scottish index of multiple deprivation decile, compared to 5% at the upper end in the least deprived. And this is actually quite, if you look carefully, the dark blue would be the young carers, the light blue, the adults. This is quite a different profile from adult carers. So young carers are actually quite disadvantaged here. Research conducted by Robson, Egan and Inglis in 2017 in Glasgow found that around one in eight pupils of 11,200 secondary school pupils were providing care for somebody. And almost one third commented that no one knew about these caring duties. There was evidence that they were more likely to be experiencing the effects of poverty. Young carers in the sample were often registered for free school meals or, and living in a lone parent household. Um, similarly, uh, in a major research survey in England in 2016, uh, young carers and lone parent families were also heavily overrepresented. Over There's also evidence that young carers themselves have a high level of illness or disability and are more likely to suffer from the effects of anxiety, stress and depression. 
There's very mixed evidence on the impact of caring in school education, but it does have an impact. This can result in absence from school to attend to caring duties, tiredness in the classroom. But research studies from the UK and Australia indicate that the complex and busy lives of young carers means they often struggle to attend to their school studies, um, which can compromise their opportunities in future employment and further in higher education. Caring duties may also restrict the demographical choices, in other words, where they go to study and further in higher education. And female carers, again, this is across the UK and Australia, are less likely to pursue third level education. Now, during the pandemic, during the reduction in social services to support young carers, uh, this put more pressure on young carers to assume even more caring responsibility. Um, many of them felt that school provides a welcome routine and respite from caring responsibilities, but this was disrupted by the, the restrictions and lockdowns and school closures, uh, and young carers began to feel higher levels of stress as they struggled to balance the demands of home learning with caring, and again, including caring for younger siblings and maybe finding a quiet place, space to study. Uh, many young carers had to deal with the deteriorating mental health of the adult person or persons they cared for, and many of them felt social isolated and disadvantaged. Now, that's, that's something that came out of COVID. However, uh, this is something that will continue post-COVID and something that uh, both in England and Scotland, people are beginning to look at more carefully and, and seeking to identify who the young carers are in schools and how they can be supported. And of course, if they are registered, then they can receive support from social services. So I'm going to hand over to John, uh, John McKendrick from Calid uh, Caledonian University. Many thanks, Stephen. Now, I'm going to talk about school food. Um, and school food is really interesting, I think, in the context of poverty and education. It's interesting because Scotland has another big mission, and that big mission is to tackle poverty, to eradicate child poverty by 2030. In 2017, the nation legislated that we would embark on a programme to use the resources available to us to reduce the numbers of children living in poverty. School food's interesting because school food features in the work to tackle child poverty much more prominently than it features in any discussion about narrowing the attainment gap in education. It features specifically in the work to tackle child poverty as improving the uptake of children who are entitled to free school meals, uh, ensuring that the uptake of those school meals happens as a, as a target, as a goal that was measured in the first iteration. Now, my research unit at Glasgow Caledonia University has been researching school food for a number of years. We've produced a series of reports for the catering sector, uh, which is largely the body responsible for uh, the delivery of school meals and the improvement of school meals. We did a sector-wide review in 2019, Are Pupils Being Served? We uh, canvassed the, the catering leads in the 32 local authorities in Scotland in 2020 to find out their early experiences during COVID. We evaluated our breakfast cart initiative in East Renfrewshire in 2021. We produced a, a good practice guide for the Poverty and Inequality Commission in 2021, examining schools that were bucking the trend. And the trend is that more pupils that are entitled to free school meals are not taking up their entitlement. And we looked at some schools that were bucking the trend to understand perhaps why that was happening. More recently, we undertook a survey of secondary school pupils in Scotland. 17,000 secondary school pupils in Scotland responded to an online survey in the autumn of this uh, school year, sharing their thoughts on school meals, and we're currently evaluating a breakfast provision initiative in a Highland primary school. Now, there's a lot of work there for going on in school meals, but it doesn't tend to feature in our debates about poverty and education, and, and I would argue it has to feature much more centrally. There have been a number of significant developments of school food in recent years that we should be aware of. There is the extension of the entitlement to free school meals in primary schools, committed then over the course of this, this parliamentary term to all, all primary school pupils to have a free school meal entitled to it. There's also a commitment to have universal provision of breakfast food, in, again, in primary schools. There's been the extension of provision of, of uh, free food in the holiday period, which might not seem like a school issue, but it's very much based in the fact that, that school meals are something that's necessary for children and has led to the government commit resources beyond the, the formal school year. Also significant in 2021 was an introduction of healthy eating in schools regulations. So it's not just a case of giving free food to pupils in need or indeed to all pupils, 
but also thinking about the quality of the food that is provided. Equally important to these significant developments in education, however, are the wider developments that mean that school food is important. We can think back to Marcus Rashford, the, the, the footballer, and his campaigning work in the COVID times to encourage the UK government to ensure that pupils had the access to school food um, when the schools were not operational. We can think of the restructuring and sharpening focus of the Scottish Attainment Challenge, which will of course Morag introduced this morning, but also there's closer working within Scottish Government to ensure that these two big agendas, tackling child poverty and narrowing the attainment gap, align much more than they have uh, been to date. And of course, there's a cost of living crisis. And I think really importantly, there's a cost of living crisis, which means school food is even more important today uh, than it has been in recent years. Now that little bit of research I referred to the 17,000 pupils in Scotland sharing their secondary school pupils sharing their thoughts on school meals uh, was published uh, a few months ago, freely accessible if anybody that wants it, but just a few thoughts that are significant regarding those pupils who are entitled to free school meals and how their experience of school food and indeed food differed. Only one half of pupils reported, all pupils reported that they ate breakfast before a school day, and that was actually only 41% of those pupils that are entitled to free school meals. Just over half of free school meal pupils ate a lunch at lunchtime and only 48% of them said that they ate a lunch regularly. So we can see right away, many pupils are entitled to free school meals come to school without having food and many don't uh, take the opportunity of the free food that's offered to them at lunchtime. And a really significant issue in terms of provision and structure of food in schools is that many free school meal pupils reported that they used their lunchtime allowance at morning break time. So they had less of that allowance left to feed themselves at lunchtime, and that clearly had implications for the end of the school day. So to wrap up then, to answer the, the three questions that I set myself, the right time, the right place, and the right way, is it the right time for school food? Absolutely. It's always the right time that we think about the role of food in terms of tackling poverty and what it contributes to the, the school day, but it's much more important today than it has been in recent years because of that impending cost of living crisis. Is it the right place? Yes and no. I think much of the new investment has went to primary schools, but the research evidence shows that the, the pupils that are less likely to eat breakfast in the morning or have a school meal at lunchtime are secondary school pupils. So I think we need a much sharper focus on secondary school pupils and their experiences. And is school food the right way? Well, clearly it's not going to solve poverty, but it's not meant to solve poverty. It's meant to ameliorate the impact of poverty and it's meant to enable children to get more out of their education. Much more radical solutions are required to tackle poverty. Much more radical solutions are required to narrow the attainment gap. But school food has an important role to play and I think has to be central to this group's thinking about how we tackle those broader issues of poverty and education. Thanks, Thank Steve. You, Thank you, John. That's that's fantastic. So what, 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 what a, a rich um, set of presentations we've had this morning. Um, and thanks to all those of you who are still with us. Now, we've only got one more presentation to go, and I'm absolutely delighted that Alison Mitchell was able to come along this morning, who is our head teacher in residence at the University of Glasgow in the School of Education. She's going to be talking about mitigating the impact of poverty from the perspective of a head teacher. Alison. Thank you, Stephen. I've got a couple of slides, if you would let me share my screen. Done. Yeah, you should be able to move. Yeah. Yep. A couple of slides. There's a couple more than a couple of slides, but I'll go very quickly. Thank you very much um, for inviting me today. Um, Stephen and John, thank you both for your presentations. I came in just at the start of your Stephen, but so much of what both of you said resonated with me. Um, I was a head teacher um, of a large secondary school until February large secondary school in an area of deprivation in Glasgow. So I'll just give a few few thoughts today just around um, the role of the head teacher and the role of the school in terms of mitigating the impact of poverty. Um, the challenges that we face, education can be seen as the answer to poverty. Um, no, it's not. Um, we have the challenge of raising the bar while closing the gap. 
we have, and recently the impact of the pandemic on the poorest families in our school communities and the challenge to close the poverty related attainment gap. And now being discussed is, you know, the recognition that we can't close the poverty related attainment gap until we um, reduce or get rid of poverty. So now it really is, it's about mitigating the effect or the impact of poverty. Through the standards for registration, it is everybody's job to enact um, social justice and professional values with the view that everyone deserves that equality and you know now and in the future. And now we're talking about when they're at school. As a head teacher, I see my role or I saw my role is as political because we have the power to influence others to bring about change. And it's very much underpinned by social justice as that value to bring change in the conditions of learning for diverse groups of learners in the school. I use this quote a lot when I'm talking with the teachers um, and the, the leaders that we are training um, and developing within the School of Education. And it really is about how do young people recognize that school is for them? And how do young people feel valued? To what extent do they feel valued? And do they feel that um, they are a part of education and that education is important and they can make a con contribution to the world? I ask these questions of our student teachers um, and our teachers, just really to think about who the young people are. The school that I was head teacher of was in an area of um, significant deprivation. Um, and it's about understanding that young people may not always be ready to learn. It's about understanding that for some young people, being in school is a, an achievement in itself. Um, and I won't go through all of these, but just have a think um, for those that are teaching young people about what that means for young people's readiness to learn and for their engagement in learning and for their ability to really focus on what's happening in the classroom. Um, the one at the bottom there who is an unregistered young carer, Stephen and I had discussions about that. And since COVID, there have been significant numbers of um, young people who are young carers but don't recognise that. And in my experience, when we are speaking to young people and their families and um, the parent or whoever it is they're caring for doesn't want to recognize or acknowledge that um, their child is a young carer and that's really difficult and as a teacher it's important that you know who the young carers are in your classroom it's important that you know who can't afford the school trip um, who may have had a situation which meant they didn't sleep, um, who may not be sure where they will sleep at night, and that we recognise that um, in the arrangements for learning, in our preparation for learning, and in the way um, that we teach and make allowances for and account for um, young people to make sure that they have the best possibility to learn in your class. And a real example of that is the young person that arrives late um, without school uniform on and in my school was very much, I'm really glad you're here, let me help you, we've got a shirt upstairs, it's not why are you late, why are you not in uniform and that um, ensures that young people feel valued and welcome in the school. There are four key things here. Um, just that I have always promoted and that I initiate, dis initiate discussion with around those that are becoming school leaders. And that is about every child in your school and having deep knowledge of their circumstances, but ensuring that they are welcome, recognized and valued because every child can learn. Poverty does not equate intelligence and every child needs to know that they are valued and are able to learn and are able to succeed. And it's how we communicate that in the classroom and in every aspect of our school and how we communicate and mitigate against poverty in terms of opportunities. For example, who gets to go on a school trip? How do we ensure that young people who can't um, afford opportunities that others can are still welcome and included? Um, the respect for families and communities, um, certainly in a secondary school, most of the teaching staff um, will not live in the community and there are views that schools are there to protect young people from their communities because communities are bad and schools are good and that is not the case at all because what that does is marginalise young people and particularly families who are living in poverty. So it's understanding the strengths of the communities and the reasons why some families 
families may not engage in school and making sure that we take responsibility for ensuring engagement and families are welcome and that we use our communities and recognise the really wonderful work, including great resilience and strength that is within our communities. Um, teaching and exercising critical consciousness. Um, I'll come on to that in a second and recognising the importance and the privilege of our role. Um, our role as teachers, as head teachers, is not for some students, it's for all. It's other people's children, it's young people and children who are going to make a difference to their communities and to societies. And that is an um, ethical activity for us as teachers and school leaders. And it's important because what we do does change lives. And that's from every aspect of um, teaching and learning from the classroom to the head teacher. I used this article with our middle leaders and our senior leaders on the programmes at the University of Glasgow, the School of Education, and it is, I'll let you just read um, the quote there, but it is, if we are preparing for a future um, that can reduce poverty or that can question poverty, questioning oppressive patterns in the world, and making sure that young people have the opportunities to do that as well, in terms of um, looking at you know, um, tough questions about inequities that people see in the world, using texts, getting young people to understand stereotypes within texts, and to ask the right questions so that they can then become the future generation who will really challenge inequity and challenge poverty. This was a great article and it's been enjoyed by those that I've recommended it to, but really the responsibility absolutely is for the young people who are in front of us in our school, but also in terms of how we educate this generation to prepare for a future generation who are really going to be challenging inequity and making sure that, um, you know, through that intentional process um, to foster that critical consciousness, not just in our teaching staff, but in our young people. And I think that's probably five minutes, so I'm happy for any yeah. questions later, yeah, and okay. I'll stop sharing just now. Okay, that's brilliant. Thanks so much, Alison. Thanks, John. Um, okay, we've, we've not got much time left, folks. Thanks so much uh, for, uh, for working with us here. If anybody's got a question, a comment, or a point they want to raise, we, we have a few minutes left. No, no. John, on you go, and then Alison, yeah. It's just that issue that we discussed earlier, Alistair raised about, you know, the words that we use. And I don't think we should shy away from focusing on poverty. And I think quite the opposite. I think we should focus on it squarely. The issue is how we approach it, how we understand it, and why we're, why we're uh, undertaking that focus. Yes, it's a problem if you're doing so in a patronising way. Yes, it's a problem if you're looking at people experiencing poverty and you're, you're viewing it a deficit model, what's wrong with them? Yeah. But that's not the only way in which we can tackle poverty. And I think very much, if, if I look at the work that's going on in Scotland just now, there's many local authorities, many different groups of professionals within the local authorities are approaching poverty in different ways at this time. And I think there's a lot of good work going on in schools that understands that too. So let's not shy away from it. Let's, let's focus squarely on what we can do to ameliorate, contribute towards tackling the problem. Yeah, um, that's an interesting point, John. Uh, MD, not you, Alistair, you've had enough. Anybody else want to come in on that? <laughs> I'm just going to add there about Alison, talking about critical consciousness there. I have to say, in all the talk this morning, one of the things that we should be doing as educators, as teachers, trainers, and as teachers, is instilling in, in, in uh, young people and children that critical consciousness to really, you know, to be central to the curriculum because. Yes, there's poverty, but unless people are empowered to really understand what's happening, then, then nothing's yeah. going to change. Yeah. And it exists in every aspect of the curriculum, an opportunity to really challenge that. And as John's saying, yeah, openly and intentionally discuss why poverty exists and how it's um, maintained. Yeah. And young people need to understand that, as do us as educators, to be able to fully um, understand what we can do to mitigate it. Yeah, good point. Okay, this is right. Okay, and does anybody else want to? We're just really hard running out of time. If anyone wants a final comment, um, I, I'll maybe, say something. <laughs> Uh, just to be a bit controversial as well and I think sometimes when we're having these discussions and I think we do have to have them head on and it's really important that they're at the forefront of our what we're doing we also have to have really hard discussions about how do we prepare children who are 
like I was at an, a disadvantage right from the get-go to be successful in a world that however much we would like it to be the world that we know would be best for everyone, it's still the world that we live in today. Um, so to exemplify this, one of the things that I did with my students, uh, people, sorry, when I was teaching was we did timed math tests, but I was very open and explicit with them about why we were doing that. I said, you're going to be tested your entire life. And if you continue to be anxious when you're tested, because I did a little study, how many of you are anxious doing time tests and everyone pretty much was, I said, well, let's work on reducing your anxiety and the happy result of this will be you'll get better at your multiplication tables. But the focus of what we're doing is helping you cope with the anxiety of being tested. So until we until there's a system in place that allows people who to be successful, regardless of where they start from, we still have to prepare children, especially in this country, to be equipped to be competitive with the children that go to the private schools and have all of that cultural capital and not only the cultural capital the education capital so i sometimes have real i really question some of the some of the contemporary movements in in education that aren't happening in a private school and at the end of that journey you've got a child who can do things that another child might not be able to do. So I think that there's hard questions we have to ask about where we want to be and the ideal, where we actually are, and the children at the heart of that who need, hopefully, to one day be able to be on the same playing field and just as competitive as everybody else. And how do you do that and still uh, respect I'm, that? I'm, I'm going to bring Alison in now, Kat, if you don't mind, Alison. Thanks, Kat. And that is the difference in young people. You know, we would take a group of young people from the school I was head teacher to a football match with the same age group who looked about three years older with shiny hair and so on. And that's noticeable. But I think it's about what, what is it that we value in terms of what young people are able to do when they leave school? And there are certain things that are valued more than others. And the debate around how we assess young people and how we capture the learning throughout perhaps the six years of secondary is a current and very important debate. And the recent um, survey that's just come out from the Scottish Government looks at do we need to broaden that base in terms of what we recognise in terms of achievement? And I think that's something that would maybe change the narrative around the five higher gold star and the highest measure of success to what our young people are able to do in terms of leadership and in terms of um, creativity and innovation and all of that. And that would possibly, you know, redress the, the kind of the real imbalance between what's valued and what's not. But I agree, we need to, young people, it's a competitive world and they, they have to be com competitive or to be able to live in a world that is competitive. But there's also the debate around um, the qualifications. So their two thoughts are, the inflated qualifications during the COVID pandemic was because they didn't have exams and the other thinking because it was the young people who were most disadvantaged that ended up improving qualifications. The other way of thinking is, was the system fairer then when they weren't um, subjected to high stakes exams? And it's about how do we assess young people to really capture what they are able to do? So there's lots in that, isn't there? Okay, I'm going to have to stop you, I'm afraid, because we, we have we have run out of time. We're going to thank uh, Angela and the Scottish Council Deans very much for inviting us along. Very, very warm thanks to all those uh, from the network who contributed this morning. Uh, a, a lot of contributions, a lot of presentations, maybe a lot to take in, but also some good hard talking. And uh, if you've been watching quite carefully, we, we don't necessarily agree with each other and everything, but, that, but that's because the questions are still a bit open-ended and that discussion still has to continue. So thank you for staying with us. It's been a long morning. Uh, hopefully it's been very helpful. Uh, keep an eye out um, for publications being produced by the various members of the network, either in, in research and publications or in research articles. And final word from Angela, our president of CIRA. Well, just to reiterate everything you've said, Stephen, thank you to everybody that's on the call for sticking with us. Lots of really interesting conversations and look forward to inviting you to another CIRA event in the future. So thank you very much. And well, thanks so much to our students who, who, who stayed with us. Thank you so much. Right, thank you. Bye bye.